This video is about the mean value theorem. So here it is. Suppose that f is a continuous function on some closed interval from a to b. And let's also suppose that this function f is differentiable on the open interval from a to b. Um, so again, all this means is that f prime of x exists as long as x is a point between a and b. Then what can we say? And there exists some point C that lives strictly between A and B such that F of B minus F of A is equal to F prime of C, so that's where that special C is, times B minus A. Um, now, we're gonna prove this in a second, but so far, if you teach like college algebra, or you've had that, or you've had calculus recently too, this should look like the point slope equation of a line. And so what it's trying to say is, is that this kind of looks like the point slope equation of the line through the point um, a comma f of a and b comma f of b and um, what we're trying to say is that there's some point where the slope of that line is the derivative of that function at that point anyway I'll draw you a picture too in a little bit that'll be very clear so how do we prove this this is kind of a slick proof where we kind of define this special function to make to do all the work for us so we're going to define a function phi from our interval i to the real numbers by the following so phi of x is going to be my function um, f of x minus the following here. And so what is all this stuff in green? What am I subtracting here? That stuff in green, here's a picture, is what the equation of the line segment connecting, again, the point a comma f of a and b comma f of b. So I tried to highlight that there. That in green is this equation y equals f of a plus blah, blah, blah. So notice I'm just subtracting this stuff here. So what does that do then? What does phi do? Phi is measuring uh, the distance or the, yeah, the vertical distance between um, the line that's kind of the dotted line there in that greenish color and my actual function itself. So um, like in other words, if this was another point, say, uh, I don't know, what's a good letter, z, then I'm saying that whatever this distance from here to here is, is what phi of z would be. So we're always me measuring that distance between the graph of the function f and that dotted line. Okay, so what are we gonna do with this phi? Why is it cool? Why do I care about that? Well, some things to notice. One thing to notice is if you plug in a to that function, so that would be f of a minus f of a, so that's gone. If I plug in an a over here, then that's gone. So phi of a is zero, that's pretty cool. And I'm gonna do the same kind of thing. What happens when you plug in b to your function? Well, this is f of a minus f of b. And if I plug b in here, then these cancel. So I just get minus f of a minus f of b. So that's zero also whenever I combine uh, these two. So what? Remember when you plug in b, these go away and all you'd have left then is f of b minus f of a minus f of b minus f of a. So the point, you've got a function phi that's zero at both the endpoints of your interval. I know that it's continuous and it's differentiable because it is the difference of two continuous differentiable functions, right? My function f's assumed to be so, and I know that uh, that line segment certainly is. Therefore, what can we say? We can apply a Rolle's theorem. And remember what did Rolle's theorem say? Rolle's theorem told us that there should exist a point between a and b such that the derivative of phi at that point is equal to zero. So Rolle's theorem helps us out there. But now let's think about what does phi prime look like? Well, here's the equation for phi up here. What's phi prime of c look like? When you differentiate this, what happens? Well, this is f prime. This would be a constant, so that's gone when you take the derivative. And then this, this is some constant right here times x minus a. When you differentiate that with respect to x, uh, you would just get the constant out front. So what do we get then? What I just said was phi prime, I just tried to talk through, evaluated c, should just be f prime at c, remember from here, but then minus, all you'd have left is the constant when you differentiate this term. And so that's equal to zero. Now all you have to do is move some things around and you get that f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. At this point in the proof, I hope that you see two, right? It's trying to say the derivative of my function at this point c is the slope of the line through the points a, f of a, uh, and then b comma f of b. But then let's just rearrange that uh, like the statement of the theorem wanted me to have it. Again, kind of reminds me of that point slope kind of form of a line. So I'm just gonna multiply the b minus a over and we're done, we got it. So that proof hopefully didn't seem too bad. This is an extremely like awesome result. And we're gonna use it um, on and off for the rest of the for the rest of the class in real analysis. We'll do some applications of it now and in another video, and then you'll also see it though when we talk about uh, the Riemann integral a little bit later on. 
But just again in a picture, what does this say? How should you read this again? With the mean value theorem, one way you could think about it is, if I think about the green line segment that connects the points uh, A, F of A, and B, F of B, what the mean value theorem kind of says geometrically is that you should be able to find at least one point on your graph, C comma F of C, where the slope of the tangent line there is equal to the slope of the line between um, A, F of A, and B, F of B. So maybe less confusingly, given that green line, you should always be able to find a point in purple so that the tangent line is parallel to the green line, no matter what. And in fact, I see that there's probably another point, if I, can, if I could draw it, let's see, maybe somewhere like uh, right here, like the slope of the tangent line at this point also looks like it would be, well, that's pretty terrible. Maybe I kind of missed, maybe here, I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, so there could be more than one point that um, satisfies the uh, conclusion of the mean value theorem. But again, that's what it's trying to say a geometric idea about it. What I'm gonna do is talk a little bit less about some of the geometric stuff and focus on some other applications of the mean value theorem. So it's essential to some key concepts and results that we'll see now and later on. So to give you one example, if F's continuous on the closed interval AB and differentiable on the open interval AB, and if this kind of goofy assumption that F prime is equal to zero for every X on the open interval AB, well then in fact, F is constant on the entire interval. So how would you prove such a thing here? Why don't we take an x in my interval, where x is to the right of a, which again is the left endpoint of my interval. So I guess I didn't introduce i, did I? When I say i, I mean this interval from a to b here. So what we'll do is we'll apply the mean value theorem on this kind of shorter interval from a to b, or from a to x, sorry. So what's the mean value theorem? Tell me. There should exist some c between a and x such that, well, f of x minus f of a is equal to f prime of c times x minus a. Right, this is the equation from the mean value theorem. And again, it's trying to say the slope of the tangent line at C should be equal to the slope of the line connecting the points on the graph when X is, uh, when your input's X and your input's A. Let's rearrange that though, or maybe let's apply what we know. In this problem, what am I assuming? I'm assuming the derivative is equal to zero for all points between A and B. Well, C is a point between A and X, so that satisfies it's such an X up there. So in particular, F prime of C, is zero. And why is that fantastic? That's fantastic because that makes this entire side equal to zero. And now I could just add this f of a to the other side. So I get that f of x is equal to f of a. Let's think about where we started this from. x was not special. x was just any point in my interval to the right of a. So in fact, what did this show? This shows that f of x is equal to f of a for every point in your interval, which is the same thing as saying that f's constant on that whole interval. Some other uses of the mean value theorem that I'll tell you about in this video are um, trying to establish certain inequalities. So to give you an example, let's say I've got this function e to the x. We haven't done much with e to the x yet. We're gonna spend some time later on trying to carefully develop what it is. But let's say I told you just right off the bat that the derivative of e to the x is just itself. And maybe you remember that from calculus. Again, we'll establish that a little more regular, rigorously in a later video. Uh, what we wanna show then just from that information is that uh, um, e to the x is always larger than or equal to 1 plus x for every real number. Now the way that we'll do that is by three cases. So case one, well, if I got to do this for every real number, let's start with my favorite real number, x equals 0. So if I plug in 0 for x, e to the 0 is 1, and that's the same thing as 1 plus 0. So in other words, this inequality is an equality, and it's true. Case two, let's take a positive number x. Well, in that case, I can apply the mean value theorem to my function e to the x, that's what f is, remember, on this interval from 0 to x. So what does that say then? That says that there should be some, some input c between 0 and x such that well, f of x minus f of 0 is equal to the derivative at c times x minus 0. Now, remember, f is e to the x, right? I assume that up here. So let's actually plug that stuff in to this equation. And so that says that e to the x minus one is equal to, well, e to the c, remember f prime is also e to the x, so that's just e to the c, and then times x minus zero, that's just this x right here. And uh, what else do we know about uh, exponential functions? Well, c is a number that's greater than zero, it's between zero and x, so it's to the right of zero, therefore e to the c should be a number that's bigger than one. So if I think about this equality now, what can I say? I can say that, uh, well, um, how do I want to say this? This number is bigger than 1, so that means that this quantity should be bigger than just 1 times x, and that's what this is right here. So again, 
I have just written down that part of the inequality at the bottom because again, that's what I'm aiming to show. So e to the x minus one is larger than x because e to the c is a number bigger than one. Finally, case three, it's pretty similar to this one, but I'll go ahead and write it out. Um, oh yeah, I guess the last thing I'd do is move this one to the other side because this is the inequality that I'm aiming for. Case three, what if x is a negative number? Same idea, we're gonna apply the mean value theorem to my function on this interval from x to zero now. And so what does that tell me? So there exists uh, a real number c between x and zero. So notice c is also a negative number since it's between, so the left is zero. Such that, same idea though. And uh, so it's like zero is my b, I'll start with that. f of b, f of zero minus f of x is equal to f prime of c uh, times the quantity um, zero minus x. So uh, what can I say from there? Well, let's plug in, I could set it f, that's kind of more general, like in the statement of the mean value theorem, I've got a function f who's e to the x, so let's plug this stuff in. f of zero is one, f of x is e to the x, and same idea, this is e to the c, and this would just be times minus x. Also notice at this point, remember x is supposed to be a negative number, so minus x would be a positive number. Now let's think what we know again about exponentials. Well, c is also a negative number because it's to the left of zero according to that, so e to the c should be a number that's less than one. So let's think about this inequality, this, this um, statement right here. What's the word I'm looking for? Expression. If e to the c is less than one, then this is smaller than just minus x on its own, right? I'm multiplying minus x by something that's gonna you know, make it smaller. And by the way, I should also probably be more careful and say that in fact, it's bigger than zero as well. That's how I know that e to the c is truly shrinking minus x. So I should be very careful about that. Um, so, what can I say then? That means that this stuff should certainly be just less than minus x on its own. Again, that idea that I've shrunk minus x here, so this quantity, if they're equal, should just be less than minus x. And why is that good? Uh, what we can do is just add some stuff around. So I'm gonna add e to the x to the other side. I'm gonna add x to this side, and that's what I wanted to show. And so what do we have? That finishes case three, unless all three cases are done. We've exhausted all possible real numbers. Therefore, my inequality holds for all real numbers. There are some similar inequalities you could do with the mean value theorem, I encourage you to try. This one's probably a little more accessible than the part C that I'll show you in a second, but sine of x is always a number between minus x and x whenever x is a non-negative number. Um, you could establish Bernoulli's inequality, it's a pretty famous one. This one's a little bit more tricky to do, but again, I'm just kind of highlighting these, I won't go into how to do them, but you could with the mean value theorem. What's Bernoulli's inequality say, in case you've never seen it before? If you've got a real number alpha that's bigger than one, then one plus x to the alpha power is always bigger than or equal to one plus alpha times x, and that should hold as long as x is to the right of negative one. And maybe the last thing that'll lead into the next video is the mean value theorem is pretty crucial to establishing the first derivative test for a relative extrema of a function on like some open interval. So again, that's kind of our segue to the next video about establishing that first derivative test and, and the buildup to it.